Thanks for joining us for this webinar on recruitment communication to grow enrollment. Just so you know, we're recording the webinar and we'll send out an email in the next several days when it's available. We've reserved some time at the end for questions and we're delighted to have Dr. Brenda Holmes on today. I'll let her take the floor. Thank you so much, Megan. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are pleased to have Oh, what might turn out to be a bit of a record number of enrollees for this uh, particular webinar joining us today. So we are delighted to see over 80 different colleges and universities represented already, and I'm sure we'll have a few more jump on. Obviously, communication and communication flow around the topic of enrollment is a big one that is well on the minds of all of the colleges and universities that Converge is currently working with. I was with um, a group of schools on Tuesday of this week, and we were discussing the fact that um, at this point in time, we, I, don't work with a single client who isn't trying to grow enrollment. So obviously, this is top of mind for everyone. Um, and we're pleased that you've taken the time out of your busy schedule today to join us for this webinar. I am looking forward to the conversation, the discussion. I'm hoping that if we don't have time at the end for questions, please feel free to type your questions in as you have them. And if there are questions that I don't have an opportunity to get to with the whole group, we will certainly try to get to that. Um, we will follow up with you afterwards and get to that with additional information. So one of the key reasons that I think this idea of um, leveraging our communication in a more effective way is such a top of mind issue today is that we are all trying to grow enrollment and the recruitment landscape as a result has gotten quite competitive. Um, as we look across the country, there are certainly certain regions that are more um, that are struggling a bit more than others, but really comprehensively, this is an issue that everyone's paying attention to. And I think as we enter into this time or maybe continue on in this time of limited budgets and no additional spending, one of the things that we've tried to figure out to do at colleges and universities throughout the country is to do a better job at every turn. And recruitment is certainly a big piece of that. One of the things that we think about as we think about growing enrollment, particularly for adult and graduate level programs, is that decisions to return to school are actually decisions that are made over time. And this is a little bit of a discussed topic in the adult and graduate market because there is some thinking or, or have been some efforts to try to narrow in what's the exact timeline that people use to make a decision. What I will tell you, I have found from nearly eight years now of talking to hundreds and hundreds of um, prospective adult and graduate level students and current graduate and um, just adult degree completers is that most of them tell me they've been thinking about returning to school for quite some time. Um, maybe the day that they turn in their application to the day they are virtually or otherwise sitting in your classes is a very short window. But realistically, the return to school is a decision that most have been rolling around in their brains or somewhere in the back of their head for a very long time. Because of that, our ability to partner with that prospective student and stick with them over time is really one of the places where we can impact our enrollment. We see, I call them false starts in the inquiry pool. The student who inquires on Monday and by the time you reach out to them on Tuesday, they say, I don't know what you're talking about. I never inquired at your school. Um, I consider those folks false starts. It's, it's not that they actually weren't interested in engagement at the time, but you know, at 11 o'clock at night, um, sitting around on the internet, we perhaps have all uh, filled out a form or submitted something online that we later think, what was I thinking? And, and I think we see that a lot with our adult students and our graduate students. Um, I come home from work on a Wednesday, I'm mad at my boss, I definitely know I could do his or her job better than they can, so I sit down and I decide I'm going back to graduate school and I fill out half a dozen inquiry forms, and on Thursday I get a raise, and by Friday I'm really not that interested in graduate school anymore. But the idea is still there. The seed is still planted. So one of the things that I'm going to encourage you to do today uh, throughout this course of this webinar is not think about necessarily how do we enroll more people tomorrow, although this will help enroll more people, not just tomorrow, but all of your tomorrows. But how do we take those folks who come into our funnel at the very early stage and hang on to them long enough that we eventually help them to enroll? 
I hang on to this quote. It's something I have um, notebooks that I carry with me in my travels and in my different at my different institutions that I spend time with. And in inside the covers, I, I take down some notes of things that just strike me when I'm on college campuses. And this was a comment that um, a woman made to me a number of years ago, a current student. But when I asked her about the process for, you know, shopping, if you will, and education and really looking for um, the right fit for her, um, she, she made this comment and I wrote it down and I've kept it with me for years and will plan to always keep it with me. She said to me, you know what I really wish is I wish somebody would have talked to me about what matters most to me, not about what matters most to you. And that is wisdom there that is hard for us to remember in higher ed. We get really excited about the programs that we offer, about our exciting delivery formats. And you guys know the rundown. The faculty who really care, the small class sizes, um, the practical experience of our faculty members, all the things you all say. And we get so excited about talking about those pieces that we sometimes forget that our consumer may or may not be interested in those things. So talking to students about what's important to them, putting ourselves in their shoes is really key, especially when we are trying to communicate with them. One of the assumptions that I make um, when I work with colleges and universities, and I'm not always saying this is a solid assumption, but it is one that I make, especially today as we sit on this webinar together, is that if you have the opportunity to engage with a student, if you get them on the phone, or even better, the, the money moment, you get them in your office, I am going to make a bit of an assumption here that you're awfully good at helping to get them engaged and talking with them and better understanding what they are looking for. Um, I, most good recruitment professionals, most people who last quite candidly in the recruitment business, um, have pretty dynamic personalities and have that ability to really connect with people once you reach them. The process that I'm going to highlight today really focuses on that idea of just starting the engagement. Really noting the fact that I know a lot of the leads that you come in, you probably actually never have that chance to talk to. Um, they never respond to any of the emails you send. They never call you back. And so how do you stay connected to them in a way that matters to them um, over time until they are ready to talk, until they come home on that day three months later and are mad at their boss again? And then they say, you know what, I am going back to graduate school. Where's that communication I've been getting from XYZ University for the last three months? I'm going to get back in touch. The suggestions that I'm sharing around engagement today um, are focused on the idea of a scripted interaction. And before everyone on the webinar right now hangs up and disconnects, please don't panic. I am certainly not and would never advocate for you putting together a script, handing it to people, and requiring them to use it. That is absolutely not my suggestion. But I am going to say this, and, and I'm almost probably a little hypocritical in saying this because I think when I was doing recruitment, you would have had a hard time telling me this. I secret shop a lot of schools every single year, and I will tell you, phone messages matter, and the quality is often terrible. Um, none of us are as good as we believe we are just with off the cuff. When we dial a phone and we you know, have 90% odds of not reaching someone, we have to know what we are going to leave for a message. And it cannot be the same message time after time when we dial a phone. When we send out personalized email, which don't get me wrong, very smart to send a very personalized and customized email, we see a lot of errors in those. We see a lot of um, <laughs> just basic typing and spell arts typo and spelling errors, but we also see a lot of grammatical errors and a lot of just giant missteps. Preparing scripts, having things written out, at least gives up not to read on the phone or not to send only as an email message, but to use as a guide is often a really smart move for, for schools to engage with. And and it really does help over time. Remember, even if they never come to school with you, you are making an impression on them. And nothing is more embarrassing than the email that I have received back from a master's program that had six typos in it. Um, it th that just should never happen, folks. And I know you're looking at one another right now, sitting around your screens thinking, oh, that never happens here. It really does happen everywhere. Um, none of us are infallible. So um, preparing with a script is wise. Okay. 
So let's talk for a minute about trying to get ourselves ready for a conversation. We're, we're talking about recruitment. We're talking about moving the metric of the number of leads come in to the number of people who actually enroll in class. Schools ask all the time, how do we get more leads? That's how we're going to grow enrollment. I'm going to suggest to you that you have just as much, if not more, opportunity to grow enrollment by high, having a higher conversion rate in your lead from your lead bucket to your enrolled bucket perhaps almost more of an opportunity there than you have by just trying to create a volume of leads. So first and foremost, you have to be prepared for the conversation. You have to think on the upfront, when I do have an engagement with this person, what is that engagement going to be about? I can almost promise you that for many of you, what that engagement is going to be about is going to be about things like our small class sizes, our personal attention, this, that, and the other thing. And folks, you all say that. Everybody says that. Whether we like to acknowledge it or not, we all have a somewhat similar product that we are promoting. And there are very few programs in the country right now that have a program that's truly so unique that some element of their program alone will sell someone on the idea of participating in it. So if we know, and I hear this all the time from you, our program's really not that differentiated. We're very similar to those programs down the street. The only difference is we cost more in a lot of cases. <laughs> um, so how are we going to position our conversation to make sure that we are engaging people about what's important to them? Remember the line, talk to me about what's important to me. I use this as a guide, um, and I will tell you right, right out of the gate, there's... Um, it, it, this is not a comprehensive use it all or it's not beneficial. If this helps you with one or two ideas as you step into a recruitment situation, perfect, great. It at least gives you a general sense. But it really guides you towards seven key areas that tend to hold great importance for most of the leads that you are going to be working with. Emphasis, what's motivating them, their experience professionally, their current employment, their earnings and what they want to be earning, so that's the money conversation, their previous experience with education, the economics of their situation, how smart are they or how explored or how much have they explored, how they're going to pay for this, and then the environmental aspects. So um, when I suggest these to you, again, I'm suggesting them to you broadly. Use them to guide the conversation. Make them unique. Make them yours. But when you are either leaving a voicemail crafting a message that's going to be sent out electronically, maybe even putting something together for social media. With whatever your messaging is, keep these key elements at the forefront of your mind. These are the things you need to talk about. Notice that nowhere on that list is give me all the details of your program. Um, that's a bit secondary. So again, the questions are used as a guide. They're not prescriptive. Um, they really should serve as a reminder and allow you to, based on responses you get, be very purposeful about your highlighting of key points of differentiation for within your program. Um, they should be a means of preparing you for that conversation and preparing the prospect for the conversation. How often hasn't it happened to all of you where you get someone on the phone, you give them your whole Unfortunately, we rarely hold it to a 30-second elevator speech. We, we talk at them for one to two minutes about our amazing program, and then we say, do you have any questions? And it's dead silence. Or we get, no, I really don't have any questions. I think you've answered it all. Click. When you ask engaging questions, you, you create situations where people will have to dialogue back and forth with you, and you give them clues as to what you're going, going to ask them about to help generate a conversation. One of the things, as everyone knows who's on the webinar, who's ever heard me speak, I am a big fan of relational recruitment. And I think it's just a critical, I think the schools that are most successful leverage relational recruitment in a very powerful way. What utilization of engaging questions or key questions really allows for is that opportunity to really begin to build the relationship. It will indeed allow you as a recruiter to eventually do your job better. And they can be set up within the written communications. So our webinar today is really going to look at two points. First point it's going to look at is we're going to run through some of these key questions or engaging questions and, and the broader frame of what they are. And then we're going to transition into phone calls and emails and some content or context of how you can craft those with keeping these key questions in mind. 
Okay. So the first key question, as I mentioned, is emphasis. What's motivating you to go back to school today? I had the strangest experience this week, and and, um, this person may even be on this webinar because I invited the group. Um, Tuesday, I was just in a really engaging conversation with a group of schools from Iowa, and um, someone said to me, oh, I used to ask, ask this question a lot, and people would get mad at me. They felt like I was being nosy into their life. I have never in eight years of talking about this sort of a question had anyone say that to me. So it's a little surprising. Um, I will suggest to you this. So much of your ability to craft this question or um, tiptoe into this question really has to do with that ability to build the relationship. So clearly this is not how you're going to lead your very first voicemail necessarily, or is it going to be necessarily the very first thing that comes out of your mouth the minute you get somebody on the phone. But really keep in mind that what you're really after, what the golden nugget of information is to get from any prospective student is, why now? If you remember, I started the webinar with the conversation that most adults consider going back to school for quite a while. And I'm sure I I feel very confident saying I'm thinking that's probably consistent with your experience in recruiting adults, whether they're graduate or undergraduate degree completers. So why now? And and truly, if we can pin down the why now enough, maybe we'll be able to answer that question of when is it that adults go back to school? This is one of the hardest questions in our part of the business. Understanding the why now gives you the insight you need as a recruitment staff member to communicate what's really important. If the why now is I just lost my job, boom, I suddenly know that some of the key things I need to talk about and communicate about in the future are things about financial aid and how you're going to pay for this and outcomes once you've completed the degree program we're considering here. So again, this why now question, really critical and something that should be woven into and something that should be asked of your prospective students. What experience, what what are they interested in getting into? How you ask this can come across in a variety of different ways, but one of the reasons why I do think this is a pretty important question Unless you have a pretty high-level graduate program, Um, just prior to this call, I was actually on the phone with a school that the average age of their grad student is is 40 and over. Um, Most of their people walk in their door with uh, 15 years experience, 10 to 15 years experience, 10 is the minimum, but 15, 19 years experience. They're probably fairly locked down into a field, and it's an executive MBA program. That makes sense. They're fairly... Um, locked into a field, but a lot of students that you talk to, even at the graduate level, if they're on the younger side, might be planning on a career change or a pretty dramatic shift in the direction that they're taking professionally. So part of what I encourage you to try to probe into more as you both prep in the phone messaging and the emailing, and then follow through with when you actually have the conversations is to better understand, you know, how carefully they've thought this step out, what their areas of interest are, and then where you as a recruiter with your expertise and knowledge of the various offerings that you have might be able to say, I know you you called me about X, but have you considered Y? Um, and, and often students are... Um, able to at least be helped with that exploration process by um, helping them to understand all the options that exist. Obviously, questions about where people are currently employed are are pretty important, and I think they kind of actually go pretty hand-in-hand with this experience question. One can lead to the other pretty easily. Um, Elements of the job that they like, what they actually do on the job. Um, One of my favorites is project managers. Um, talk to and go out and explore people who do project management. And it is really quite a, uh, I don't know, it's quite a mix of different experiences that they often can bring to the table. But there are some links within that mix that are often very similar. Typically, not always, but typically project managers, especially if they're managing projects that involve a lot of people, are tremendous communicators. And so you can begin to pick up on different skills um, in relationship to some of the work that they're doing. You can also identify some of the skills they have within their current employment that might translate nicely into a different degree offering or different program for them, long-term goals professionally. I like to pose questions or at least float thoughts um, in written communications about ways to pay for school. Um, And please, I am begging you, don't just direct people to the FAFSA form. Um, 
I'm often surprised in people who work in higher ed when I say, have you seen the FAFSA form lately? Have you been to the website you keep directing people to? And they haven't been there. They've never been there. It's kind of like directing somebody to make themselves comfortable on a hard wooden bench. Um, it's a tough, tough, tough um, web form. It is highly impersonal. It's really cold. So when we talk about and try to help students to think about the financing of education, I think we have to lead the conversation in a stronger way. And it has to be more than go fill out the FAFSA. Um, so again, we'll, we'll lead into some different ways to communicate about this, but I am a big believer that the financial piece is almost always a piece you are more than safe discussing with someone, even if you've never talked with them. This is a perfect content for an email, always. Um, if they have employer tuition reimbursement, that's the worst information you're going to have. The money's really not that important to me. My boss is paying for it boom, question answered, but nobody's going to think it's out of left field to talk about funding their education. This question often makes people feel a little bit uncomfortable, and, and I think it is all in how you ask it, but is your current income meeting your needs? Um, is income a motivator for you in returning to school? It's awkward to say, um, and, and it is sensitive. So I would say that earnings might not be something that you're going to include within the body copy of email or even on a phone message, but you can often talk about paying for school in those other formats, and then it sets you up nicely for this conversation once you get somebody um, either on the phone or in your office. Who knows you're looking at coming back to college? Um, it's interesting how revealing this question is. And as I said when we started this, you might, as a recruiter, think about adding one or two or three of these elements to your current approach. It is, it is not a situation of you have to use all of these, although I do know some who do use all. Um, but there might be a piece here I'm hoping to kind of jar something loose for you that, that kind of makes you think, yeah, that, that works for me. I know how I can leverage that. And that feels congruent with who I am as a recruiter. We all, all, all good recruiters bring their personalities to the job. And all good marketers understand the um, personalities or the temperament of the recruiters that are, that are building their enrollment for them. So being able to leverage that in a positive way just makes sense. <clears throat> Understanding who knows that they're even considering this provides you huge insight to their level of seriousness. And I use this example all the time. Um, if you've ever tried to lose weight, quit smoking, um, give up caffeine, if you wake up on Monday morning and lying in bed think, I'm going to give up caffeine, by the time you get out to the kitchen and pour yourself your first cup of caffeinated coffee, no one knows if you've failed or not. No one knows if you accomplished your goal or not because you didn't share your goal with anyone. If you ask this sort of a question and you get a response like, well, my boss has been encouraging me to come back so he knows that I'm here and my spouse knows that, that I'm here and I actually talked with my kids about it because it's an evening program, you now know that their level of seriousness is enormous. You also know that they have a bit of a support system because probably... They aren't spending much time with you or aren't too engaged with you. If, if those folks that I just listed haven't at least at this early point said, yes, you should at least consider this. Um, that doesn't mean they won't change their mind later um, and not, you know, get off the support system bandwagon. But it at least gives you a hint to the fact that they've started to float this idea about. And this can be tremendously beneficial as a recruiter if you position this in electronic communication. Remember, they may or may not engage with you, but you want to get them thinking about different topics um, when you're communicating with them. So a really helpful question. And then past educational experience, especially, and I know we have some folks on the webinar who are folks who work with degree completers. Um, especially if you're working with degree completers, but also just for those considering going back to graduate school. Finding out what their previous experience was with education, or at least planting the seed that you're interested in that, opens the door for what is often one of the bigger fears that most adult students have when they consider going back at any level. Can I do this? Maybe I wasn't the greatest student before. I just got through undergraduate degree with a 2.75 GPA. Can I really do a graduate program? 
what did I like about it? What didn't I like about it? If you have an online program, have I ever done anything online before? So really opening that discussion up. If you do have degree completion, it also really throws open the door to the idea of discussing transfer and discussing in a way that's meaningful to them. Okay, so that kind of gives you at a high level. So if you keep those seven elements in the back of your head as you're putting together your communication with the primary goal being of budging conversion rates, not I'm trying to generate more leads, but I'm trying to move my conversion rates. I'm trying to take my folks who've already said they're interested. I've raised my hand. I've said, tell me more. How are you going to get me through to being enrolled in class? No surprise that I'm all about a process here. Um, Recruitment is something that for many, many, many years, and still at many, many institutions, I see being done on an as-I-get-to-them um, basis. Oh, I follow up with students, you know, somewhere within that first couple of days of when they email. And then I send them the mail, pa mail packet, and then I send them a personal email, or I leave them a phone message. And that's where it stops. So one of the things that I think is crucial and one of the things that's in one of my final slides is that first and foremost, you have to be willing at your institution to have a really, I don't mean to say ugly, but a really deep, honest conversation about what we're doing right now when a lead comes in. And how do we define a lead? Um, and, and that right there can be a pretty million dollar question if you unpack it correctly. If we have somebody um, I, I used to work with a great gal named Brenda who was our front desk person. So I'm just going to use her as an example. So if we have a front desk person named Brenda who's worked at the institution for a lot of years and has a lot of information about our programs or our offering, when that phone rings and Brenda answers it and a student says, hey, I just have a quick question about your MBA program. Brenda's inclination and your inclination because you're busy and you have too many things on your plate already is to just try to help that student and answer that question, right? And that's exactly the mindset that we want Brenda to have when she answers that phone. So Brenda's going to say, well, what's your question? Let me see if I can help you. And perhaps the student does have some very pointed questions. Well, what nights do I have to come? I know it's a hybrid program, and I know there's some time on campus. What nights are courses? Blah, 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 blah. Brenda answers all the questions. She does a great job. And that student says, thanks, that answered my questions, and hangs up the phone. That was a missed lead. That was a missed opportunity. And while it was playing on Brenda's skills and knowledge base of the various programs that you have to offer, it really actually didn't help you at all. Because you now have no contact information on that student and have no ability to follow up with them at a later time. Remember I talked about at the beginning, adult students and graduate students think about this for a long time. We want to be with them the whole time they're thinking about it, not just for the three or four weeks it takes for them to bring in their application and enroll in class, but we want to be with them the whole time they're thinking about it. Even if their comment, when Brenda says, well, could I grab your information? Even if they say, eh, I'm actually not thinking about coming back to school for a year or two, so I'll just call back later. Click. We have to become motivated to grasp and grab contact information from every lead we possibly can. And that, that doesn't mean you have to be obnoxious about it, but more than likely you can turn up the volume just a little on how you're doing this. Become a little bit more um, aggressive about helping people to understand the benefit of them sharing your contact information. We have a newsletter that comes out twice a year that I'd love to put you on that list for. Could I grab an email address from you? Very simple stuff, low barrier stuff. The second question that I want to urge you to think about when you think about developing a process is are all leads responded to, the, to in the same manner? And by same manner, I mean exact same manner, no matter what. Um, for most schools, the answer to this question is no. If you ran into me at a college fair last night and I set up an appointment with you tomorrow, the odds of me putting you into the CRM might be lower than if you filled out the lead form on our website, which actually pumps straight into our CRM. The follow-up after you meet with me tomorrow, for you, because you're not in the CRM yet, is going to look very different than for that lead that automatically came into our CRM. So we have to get consistent about how we're responding to leads. Leads that play ball with us. Many of you have heard me use that phrase before. The lead that you throw the ball and they actually throw it back, that they engage with you. But also those leads that you throw them the ball and it just lands at their feet. You throw them another ball and another ball and another ball. 
because sometime over time, remember, they get mad at their boss again, and they are going to say, yep, I am going to finally toss that ball back. I am going to respond to that email. How leads are tracked in the system is also a piece that has to be looked at very, very carefully, obviously, where your CRM, and then is every lead tracked in our system, so no pre-qualifying leads. I am a big believer that nothing happens in the recruitment world by accident. Um, again, I know some amazing recruiters. None of us are good enough to keep this in our head. None of us can have a system where, oh, on Fridays from 2 to 4, I just reach out to all my people. No, you probably reach out to about 90% of the people who are at the top of your mind. In that 10%, there might be one or two students who are going to enroll in your program. Remember, fiddling with conversion rates really the goal here. So uh, through a process, and now over the course of seven and a half, almost eight years, I've been doing a lot of secret shopping with a lot of different schools, and I've had the great privilege of being involved with a lot of schools who've had a lot of enrollment success with adult and graduate level students. So what I do when I run into those schools is I ask them for their recruitment approach. And without fail, they have a clear process, and they follow it without fail. And I have taken those various recruitment approaches, boiled them all down, and spit out on the other side of that this particular approach. I want to be very cautious in saying because somebody's going to ask the question, so is the email on day six, is that the critical piece? It, it's not. And it's really not critical that it's a call, then an email, then a call. The key here is this is a process, and we follow it with every single student especially the students who are not getting back to us. If you think about just basic human nature, you spend more time engaged with people who are engaged with you. The people who don't play ball, the people who never call you back, the people who never respond to those emails are real. They keep telling us no, non-verbally, they are telling us no by not engaging with us. And that hurts our feelings. At the end of the day, we're all just people. That hurts our feelings. As a recruiter, it is far more intuitive to engage with the people engaging with us than it is to stay after these people who don't seem to want to communicate with us. So the key here is setting up a recruitment approach and a process that happens for everyone, regardless of if they are communicating or not. This is the approach that I suggest to schools, aggressive perhaps, but not over the top. And I always get the question, oh, I don't want to hound people. You're not. So stop worrying about it. A week, 10 days, you know some of your students. Think about that. Think about some of those moms that you have who are soccer moms and have three kids and have the spouse who has the busy job and travels all the time and they have a full-time job and they're members of the PTA and they're volunteering in every organization. 10 days passes in a blink. They don't even remember that you've called them, let alone called them twice in 10 days. So this is not over the top, um, but it's a it's a consistent process to stay with somebody who doesn't call you back right away, who doesn't respond to your first or second email, and it just helps you to stay with them. You'll notice at the bottom, obviously here, the, the most intense efforts are within those first three weeks. Um, there have been, we can actually be real grateful, a number of the for-profit um, institutions have really helped us to better identify for students who are going to engage, who literally submit the form on Monday and who are really going to be sitting in class the next month or two, that first couple of weeks is really critical. Some will even tell you it's that first 24 to 48 hours. Whoever gets there first will get the student. And to some degree that's true, but I also need to help you to create an approach that makes sense for you at your institution. So this approach I think is aggressive without being over the top. And it really does have a heavier amount of communication and dialogue going on with the student, even if it's only one-way dialogue during those first couple of weeks. I do, I honestly think of everything on this plan, if you can only do five, do five. If right now you do two things, we send a mail packet and I send them an email, great. Add two additional and you're better than you were before this webinar started. The maintenance piece at the end, that follow-up, whether it's a newsletter, whether it's an occasional announcement that goes out, it can't always be the same, though. That is the key, but that is the piece that often keeps people connected to you over long periods of time, and I'm telling you it's years sometimes, before they finally say, you know, XYZ University has stayed with me, even though I inquired with them two years ago. I'm going to give them a call now. I'm ready to go back to school. Okay. 
I am taking a guess. I obviously do not know the individual situations of all of the 101 schools who are involved in this webinar right now, but I'm going to suspect that first and foremost, you need to add in at least a couple intentional points of contact to your current process. Now, for some of you, you're looking around your colleagues and you're saying, do we even have a process and is it written down anywhere? Okay, then you have a slightly different place to start. But for those of you who say we have a three-step process we follow with everyone no matter what, terrific. Add in two more steps. If that's all you can do, it's better. The second thing I'm going to suspect that you probably need to do is you're going to have a purpose, also known as a script, for each point of contact, I'm going to show you what those, I'm going to show you some samples of those, again, not to sit and read off them, but to use them as a template, to use them as a starting point. And, and I have been in this business for a very long time. Even the best recruiters that I've known who've been doing this for a decade or more, pull out that script and read over two or three times before they call that person, read over, okay, what's the key point? What am I trying to make happen during this phone call or during this message? turn the paper back over and then dial the phone. I know how you guys do phone calls <laughs> because I've watched you do it and I've probably been guilty of this myself. It's 3.15, I had blocked on my calendar from three to four that I was gonna make some phone calls with some leads, so it's finally 3.15, I'm gonna do it. I shut my office door, I grab my list and I just start dialing. My mind is still on the lunch I just ate, the conversation I just had with my coworker, the meeting I just wrapped up, and the fact that I'm angry with my spouse, but I'm dialing that phone and I'm getting that first voice message. And what I'm leaving is something that sounds like, this is Brenda from XYZ University, really trying to reach out to you based on your interest in our MBA program. Give me a call back at, fill in the number, click. About the most impersonal message you can possibly leave, right? And the reason it's impersonal, the reason that's a bad message is because you didn't plan for it. So again, scripts. Um, I'm also going to tell you that I'm going to guess as you think about developing any of this, you're probably making it far harder than it really needs to be. I actually worked with a school once who I spent a little time with them and then I was back six months later and I said, how do we do on putting together some standard emails to send out? Well, we're still working on them. And truly, I know you're now having a chuckle with your colleagues because this is probably you a very small number of people actually open those emails. You're not trying to find the cure for cancer in a couple of sentences that you're putting into an email. All you're trying to do is get some engagement going. Don't make it harder than it needs to be. One paragraph, maybe two, and you're done and stop. You don't need to tell them about everything you have to offer. And then following the process, many of you I know have a process, but nobody's following it. Okay. So I wanted to give you a share with you a few samples here and I'm going to keep myself moving along. Um, so I indicated to you that on day one, when somebody inquires, there needs to be a message sent back. I want to encourage you all to take a look at what that looks like, because I'm guessing it looks like the first thing. Thank you for your inquiry. Someone from our admissions office will be getting in touch with you. My money says that's what your message is or something awfully close to it. Take a look at that second example. Thank you for your interest in XYZ University. We're delighted you have considered us as you are looking for an affordable and flexible evening program for adults. That right there tells them a little bit more. Brenda or Nancy from our admissions office will be following up with you within the next few days to further discuss your goals. Remember again, not our program, but your goals. We look forward to working with you as you make this important personal and professional decision. I think it's okay to make some assumption that many of your students are professionally motivated. And so I would go ahead and put that in a slight difference. And, and you got, everyone's going to have access to this webinar afterwards, lift that exact language and just drop it in. You don't have to think about it. Don't go crazy over it. Lift the message, get your correct names in there, put in the name of your school, drop it in, um, but get something a little more personal right from the start. Second communication, whether this is that email or that phone call. So again, I don't know this about your school, but I'm guessing at most of your institutions, an inquiry comes in and you probably actually get a number of inquiries late in the day or overnight. But let's say an inquiry comes in at 530 on Tuesday. On Wednesday, you get to work and this inquiry is sitting in your inbox as a recruiter and you now have to do something with it because this is our process and you're going to follow your process because Brenda told you you had to. So you're either going to send a personal email or a phone call at this point. First and foremost, if you are thinking about sending in, and I'm using air quotes here, right, the privacy of my home, a personal email, 
you need to have somebody else put it together for you or with you. Have it written out, have it already ready. We're going to take a minute and look at this one. I just put this together quickly, but here's just something to think about. Thank you for taking the time to inquire about XYZ University. My name is Brenda, and I'll be assisting you throughout your process with us. I'm anxious to hear what's happening in your life right now that's gotten you started thinking about returning to school. If possible, I'd like to speak with you to discuss what you are looking at for your educational in your educational experience. Please let me know if you're available by phone anytime this week. My schedule is flexible and I'm able to call anytime before 7.30 p.m. That right there, fill in your name, your school, is a far better email than any personal communication I'm going to guess that's being sent out right now that is more the dump of you inquired about our MBA program. It's flexible. It's offered at night. It's Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Our faculty really care. We have small class sizes. Here's a link to the FAFSA form. Here's this. Here's that. To fill out the application, go here. You guys know what those communications look like that are going out. Put together something that's a little more personal, personalized like this. If you want to, and you're really, really, really good, and I want you to be honest with yourself about if you're that good. I will tell you personally, I'm not. If you want to, have this as the standard, and then if you as a recruiter want to personalize this message with an extra sentence at the bottom or two, that's your opportunity. It's not writing the whole email. It's just getting in an extra sentence or two. Have something like this prepared for you or in partnership with you. And the good news is it can be the same across all your recruiters. Okay, so we get around to day three and you're going to make a phone call. And yes, I do think a phone call is important. And here's why. When you think about building a relationship, and I've already admitted I'm a big believer in relational recruitment, when you are thinking about building a relationship with people, email gives you one level of communication and one level of relationship building. You're emailing back and forth, and that's great. The first time you get that person on the phone, or they hear your voice and you hear theirs, you have a deeper level of relationship, boom, just immediately. You actually get that person face to face and that's where the magic happens, right? So it's a series of steps. The phone call is critical because number one, it makes you real. It's not just some dumped email that comes out of some garbage system that every school has. It's really personal. And you have that opportunity to add your personality and who you are as a human being to it. But it has to have a purpose. Why are you even picking up and dialing that phone? What are you hoping to accomplish with that phone call? Do not dial your phone with the assumption that you are getting a voicemail. And again, I know you do 90 or 95% of the time, but you have to be ready for the live <laughs> answer. It's, it's actually quite funny. If, if you do secret shop competitors, answer your phone after they've left you about five or six messages, they hardly know what to do with themselves. There's this weird, awkward thing on the other end of the phone, unless they have a purpose. This takes 10 extra seconds. I'm not saying pull out their file, review all their information. I'm simply saying get yourself in the right frame of mind to leave this message or to have a conversation. So this is a message that if it were me, I would have prepared for my recruitment staff, not to have them sit and read it, but to have them read through it two or three times before they jump on the phone. So they're going to leave this message because more than likely they are leaving a message. Good afternoon. This is Brenda and I am with XYZ University. You may have received my email yesterday and I was hoping we might be able to set up a time for me to hear more about your professional goals and what interests you most about returning to school. I'm available at my phone number until 730 tonight. I look forward to hearing back from you. Boom simple it's well prepared it's really not that much different than probably what you rattle off but because you rattle off the same message over and over and over and over it starts to sound a little stilted and if you have this message written and you follow something pretty close to this when you leave this voicemail when you leave a voicemail on day six or when you leave a voicemail on day 14 it's not going to be the same message over and over and over and someone might actually listen to it okay Got to keep ourselves moving along here. So day six is an email. Um, plant the seeds of the benefits of your institution. But again, just plant the seeds. Don't, don't choke anybody with the seeds. Don't only talk about it, but just plant the idea. Um, as you consider returning to school to earn your degree, I wanted to mention to you that XYZ University places a premium on your current and past work experience. Um, many of our students have already gained valuable knowledge in their professional roles, and we are anxious to explore with you if you might not be eligible to earn college credit based on your experience. 
where you work, what types of positions you have held, and what skills you have gained in these positions are all important to us. Simple body copy, if you do anything around prior learning assessment or anything like that, perfect. If you don't do anything around prior learning, or at least you don't do anything with much you know, serious intention, you can literally substitute out the work experience piece. If you are doing degree completion, you can fill in credits that you might have taken at other places. This email is put together to be fairly flexible. Again, this is one paragraph. Note, there is no huge blast of information about all of the intricacies of your program. There's no link to the FAFSA form. There's none of that business. We're not trying to do everything in one email here. We're simply, again, continuing to give them a taste. And we're hinting at, if you think back to those six or those seven E's, we're touching on some of those E's. We're prepping the conversation. Day 10, we've got a phone call. A couple of just good practices. First and foremost, call at different times of the day. You always know a school that's serious about recruitment when they track what time of day they're making their phone calls. Um, it is a beautiful thing when I secret shop a school and get a morning, an afternoon, and an evening phone call. That doesn't happen by accident, folks. That's on purpose. Track what times of day you're making your phone calls. If your office is not open in the evening, and by evening I do not mean 5.30 or 6.00. By evening, I mean past six. You probably ought to consider it or you ought to be asking your recruiters to take home a phone list and make some phone calls from home that evening. I'm not asking people to work 10 hours at night. I'm saying you got 30 minutes. Here's 10 phone numbers. Let's make some phone calls. Have a message prepared before you get them, you know, before you dial your phone. And just in case they should answer the phone, especially if you've mixed up your times, have the questions ready that you want to ask them. Have some of those engaging questions prepared. Okay, so um, another voicemail option here. This is Brenda calling from XYZ University. So sorry I've missed you. I'm guessing like most of our students, you are very busy with work and other obligations. We know time is important, which is why XYZ is so committed to accepting credit from other colleges you may have attended. We value the educational and professional experience our students bring to the classroom and award credit to help you move towards your goal of graduation more quickly. I would value the chance to speak with you further about your previous educational and work experience. Again, think of the ease. We're, we're tiptoeing into them here. Day 14, some more samples. And I'm going to start moving through these a little bit more quickly. Paying for school, we have to talk about it and we have to introduce it. I don't mind telling you a lot of students aren't going to engage with you until they understand if they can even afford you. So putting that out there right up front is really smart. In the sample that I've given here, what I'm suggesting is that you actually leverage student personas to make this real for them. Three student personas, remember they have nothing to do with any one student on your campus, but looking at how much money they make, what their financial aid award was, if they have employer tuition reimbursement, that should be one student, any grants or scholarships that you're granting, samples of repayment programs. This is a big one. So often when students borrow money, they, because of all of the press around the high cost of education, because of all of the press around this huge student loan debt, people, I, I really believe, think to themselves, if I borrow $20,000 to go to school, my monthly payment's going to be $900 a month. It's going to be another mortgage. These are the horror stories we're reading about right now. You have to do the math out for them, and it has to be realistic. Students who borrow $20,000 have a monthly payment on a 30-year plan of $125. 125 bucks is an honest number, and I'm not saying that's the number. You need to have financial aid help you with this, but it's a, it's a much more palatable thing, and then they're making an educated decision. Then they're saying, oh, well, that's better than I thought it was. Heck, that's even less than my car payment is. Day 18, I'm going to suggest that you set an appointment. Again, I'm assuming a phone message here. Um, I'm sorry our schedules don't seem to be matching up easily. Perhaps it'd be better if we set a time to speak by phone. I'm going to send you an email with an appointment for a phone call, and you can just let me know if that won't work for you. In the meantime, feel free to call me at. This sets up the phone, the email you're going to send. This, right now, I have it scheduled sending it three days later. You might just send it the next day. Um, I wouldn't... I, you can send it right away, but I'd wait till the next day. Again, another point of contact here. The important piece here is at the bottom. I'm planning to call you on Monday the 13th at 6 p.m. Please let me know if you'd like to change our appointment. If you refer to it as an appointment and you schedule it with them in this manner, you've told them on the phone you're going to do it and you've sent them the follow-up email, you'd be surprised how often this email doesn't trigger someone to respond to you and say, 
perhaps I'm not interested in an appointment, take me off your list. That's perfectly fine. Or, hey, that time doesn't work for me. Can we set something else? Great. Remember, all we're really trying to do here is to get them to throw the ball back. So this is often a good way to do it. And yes, you need to put this on your calendar. And then yes, you need to call them again at 6 p.m. on Monday um, just to make that happen. But this is another nice um, thing to use. I stopped at that point, mainly because, as I assumed, we would run out of time if I tried to go through all of them, but that gets you started. Now, here's what I'm going to suggest to you, and I have a couple of more slides, so stick with me for a little bit. That gets you started. I am going to urge you, please don't make it harder than that. I Full disclosure here, I wrote up those little blurbs, and I'm not saying they're lighting the world on fire, but I wrote those up in less than an hour. Don't take more time than that. If you have to take three or four hours, but please stop with that notion of trying to make it the perfect message, trying to make it the perfect thing. Get something put together and follow it because the magic happens over continuous communication. It's not anything enormous and revolutionary that you're putting in any one message. Stick to the process and you're going to be in far better shape. Okay, a couple of follow-up thoughts here. First and foremost, you have to do what makes sense for your school. You might be an institution that other than mailing the packet has never done anything. You start asking recruiters to make this number of contacts, somebody's probably gonna have cardiac arrest going on in their office, right? Lean into this in a way that makes some amount of sense for you, but I will tell you, you need to be doing, gosh, minimally, three contacts to five contacts, minimally. You're not even in the game if you aren't at least doing that. And they have to be set, and they have to be scheduled, and they have to be followed. I will tell you, when you look at the spectrum, um, I recently, just right around the holidays, secret shopped a school for another school. And that institution, for 38 days in a row, either called me, sent me an email, or had a text message, or had a pre-recorded reminder coming out to my phone every single day for 38 days in a row. And on a whole lot of days, it was doubled up. That's kind of the spectrum, folks. And, and I know what you're thinking. Well, that's a for-profit. No, it's actually not. Um, I know that, that in your heads you're thinking, oh, I don't want to overwhelm people. Oh, I don't want to. This, this may very well be your competition. This is an institution with quite a broad reach. Um, this may very well be your competition. Your mailed packet and one phone message doesn't stand a chance next to this amount of inquiry because their odds of catching me on the day that I'm frustrated with my boss and decided, you know what, I am going back to grad school. Oh, and look, I just got this message from XYZ. I'm calling them. I am not promoting, you know, text messages or pre-recorded or anything like that. I, I, that's a personal choice that your institution has to make. But what I'm saying is it's the amount of, it's the repetition. Okay, a couple of other quick ideas here, just to try to give you a couple more things to think about before we end our time today. It is great within the context of an email or on a voicemail message to allow or offer the possibility to let a student speak with another student. You have to make the, the connection for them, though. Hey, if, if, um, if it'd be more helpful for you to speak to one of our actual students in our MBA program, I'd be happy to set that up. Give me a call back at XYZ number, and I'll make that connection for you. This is a great way. You just it, Very few students will actually take advantage of this. I know schools who have thought this was a great idea and instead tried to put together a fleet of um, ambassadors before they launch this program. It, not really necessary. If you have one student who's a pretty, you know, that you're like, ah, I could ask them to do that, you have plenty. Go forward and see how many students actually bite on this idea. Another thing that I like, and I've seen a couple of schools do that's been kind of fun, is to creating a special sitting class night. Um, you have to be careful about this, um, and you actually have to kind of plan a little bit. You want to be sure to have a class or two or three um, that you have been purposeful about selecting and been purposeful about selecting the faculty member teaching it, um, and obviously gotten permission ahead of time. But basically send out a special bulletin to students in your lead pool and saying, we're going to try something different. We know a lot of you are a little hesitant about coming back to school. We wanted to give you a chance to sit in one of our great dynamic classrooms. Please respond to us if you'd be interested on Monday the 13th to spend a little time in one of our classes. Kind of a fun option. 
creating tools for students that they can click on and then monitor who clicks. This is really, really smart. And if you're not currently doing this, I want to really advise it because most of your systems, nearly all email systems have the ability to monitor whether or not a student opens an email and then whether or not a student interacted with an email. And if you send out small batches, um, if Brenda Harms has 75 leads that she's working right now as your recruiter, and you send out an email specifically to that batch, you should be able to give Brenda Harms a list of, here's the 20 people, I'm having a really good day. Here's the 20 people that it was amazing subject line. Here's the 20 people who opened that email, Brenda, and here are the 10 who actually clicked on the link to the tool or the resource that you provided. If I'm Brenda Harms, I'm picking up the phone and calling those 10 folks. They're far more engaged than the people who never open the email. I also recommend that we pay attention to the call blitz. This is something that we can steal from the traditional undergrad side of the house that really works effectively on the adult side of the house as well. Set it up. Recruitment staff are going to work till 830. Eh, it's the same old story. Give them some pizza. People are happy to hang around and do some dialing, do some phone calls. Whether you do this monthly or quarterly, um, I just think it's really smart. It mixes up that time and it's another personal contact. Okay, final slides. And we're going to come right up to time. Sorry, please type in your questions and I'll get back with you with responses. First and foremost, you need to have a really honest conversation. What is your current process or are you currently using the as I get to it process? There's no shame in being on an as I get to it process right now, but you got to be honest about this. Can you afford to continue? to allow your recruiters to follow up as they see fit. And I'm, I'm just gonna tell you folks, higher ed's gotten way too competitive for that. I, I just, it's, we're just not there anymore. And, and yeah, that's unfortunate. This really is an opportunity for us to kind of put something in place that we can all follow. I also want to urge you to encourage and train your recruitment staff around building relationship rather than simply providing information. Um, anyone can provide information. Candidly, they'll just get it off your website. What you really need them for is to build that relationships. So your next step, something I hope you can take a few minutes and do right after this webinar is agree on a process. And I want to be really clear, if you are a recruiter sitting in the room and you're currently thinking, I wish you'd just shut up, it's probably because you really don't either, number one, want to change what you're currently doing, or number two, you feel like I'm telling you what you need to do or somebody else is about to. Normal reactions, but again, a hurdle we need to get over. We have to start small and then do a little bit more, and then again, Go back and evaluate in six months. Make sure you're maximizing the use of your CRM. You really have a great tool if you have a CRM and you really have a lot of ability to segment. You need to make sure that you're doing that. I'm also going to encourage you that if you already have some written communications in place, you need to do a review. The first thing you need to do is just plan to cut half of it. I'm yet to see a written communication plan or series of emails that I have not suggested at least be cut in half. Um, you might be the exception, but I'm, I'd be pleasantly surprised if you were. Um, if they're only talking about you, stop. Nobody is that interested in your program. I mean, they are, but only to a certain degree. And you cannot tell every single thing about your program in one or two emails. Take a look at what you're offering in, within the context of those emails. The other thing I'm going to urge you to do is to fight the urge to set up a committee to get some of this put in place. Yep, I caught you. I knew you were already thinking about it. The exchange has already gone around the table. We're going to have a committee and we're going to get this done. Please don't. Someone just needs to grab this. It needs to be assigned to someone, get some communications put together, and get it launched. Um, good and out the door is far better than the communication committee reviewing this for six months. Um, the review process, as I said, should take an hour, not a semester. Um, and don't let your communications be driven by academic language. You're going to have to take a look and be willing to look hard at both your people and your data. You should have some sense of how many people are opening what emails. You should have a sense of if you're A-B testing your subject lines and emails as to what's getting opened and what's not. You have to be willing to follow that. You also have to be willing to track people's actions within the CRM. And yes, accountability is a real scary thing if you're a recruiter, but it doesn't have to be. It's also your opportunity to get caught doing everything right and having great conversion rates. So really important. I'm going to close in our literal last minute. I'm sorry to, to have taken quite so long. I want to encourage you. If any part of this has been helpful to you, I'm going to kind of take this the next step into retention. We see a lot of schools who struggle with once students say they're going to enroll, they never actually show up. And so we're really going to look at retention beyond that point of saying yes 
and how that's going to move forward over the course of, and I, I haven't completely finished that webinar yet, but you know, over the course of that first term or that first semester, how are we going to keep folks with us and then what to put in place in the future beyond that initial time. I want to thank you for joining us. Um, please, I hope you have typed in your messages and your questions as you've had them. Megan will get those to me and I will respond to you, if not yet this week, by early next week. Um, I'd welcome the opportunity to visit with you more further and thank you for making this important. Um, getting more students involved in education is obviously something that I'm passionate about and I know you are as well. So thanks for taking your time today to learn a little bit more. I hope it's been helpful. Have a great afternoon, everyone.